We got subscribers to help us out in our latest MyGM challenge, and it turned out to be by far the hardest challenge that we've ever attempted. It's close to impossible, but is it actually impossible? Against three AI opponents on the hardest difficulty settings, with the hard AI buffed in a recent patch to the most difficult that it's ever been, we wanted to see if we could win in MyGM using an entire roster of created wrestlers, or cores, submitted by our subscribers. And we customised all of them to start on one popularity, the absolute lowest it can go. Popularity drives match ratings, and this makes it impossible for us to put on good shows without building our cores into superstars. And with just 25 weeks in the season to come out with a victory in the fan standings after WrestleMania, we wouldn't have much time to do that at all. I failed this over and over again, and decided it was time for one final attempt. Welcome to the One Pop Challenge. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, this run was absolutely brutal. I had multiple attempts where by week 5 there was no hope for me. Despite my best efforts, I knew I couldn't do this alone, so I made the executive decision to draft in Luke to help me plan a strategy in a Discord call. Every week had to be absolutely perfect if we were going to do this, and we needed to make sure that we stuck to a strategy no matter what. The people that are going to be your, your title holders. We actually just want them going into normal matches in the mid card. They're just going to put on one star, one and a half star matches in the earlier weeks. But that's fine. All we want to do is make sure they appear and work on their popularity and don't lose any stamina. Every week they don't appear is a wasted opportunity for us to build their popularity, even if it's only going up by a little bit. And then because you have such a big roster, you have like a huge number of people that they just can't appear every week, even if we wanted to put them in every week. So they should be in the opener and the main event, and they should just be in huge stipulations. Throw them in a hell in a cell. We've got so much money to play with. They've got so much stamina to play with. We're going to nail the drama curve every single time when we do this, hopefully, until the popularity starts building anyway, just in these earlier weeks. Once we had our plan in place, we were filled with hope and excitement that this could actually be possible. But little did we know at this point, we were about to go through what can only be described as an emotional roller coaster. For our GM, we decided on Tyler Breeze, as we couldn't decide who we drafted, therefore meaning that stamina was out of our hands. So his quick recovery power card would help us out with this if things got rough. Smackdown was our brand, as their Birth of Legends power card was going to be a game changer for us. Plus 6 popularity to 6 random superstars would decide who would be getting an early push, so that was crucial. The draft was then a simple but key process. We filtered by popularity, and signed all of our subscribers one popularity superstars that were available. This in itself was a risk though, as we had absolutely no control over the potential class types that we'd have access to. Immediately, this caused issues in the women's division, with us drafting three giants and one specialist. If that wasn't worrying enough though, they also all had pretty terrible stamina. Not a good start at all. It was clear that if we were going to raise the popularity as quickly as possible on our main event stars, they were going to need to fight every single week. So by that logic, we chose our champions based off of stamina alone. Wyvern became our inaugural SmackDown Men's Champion, and it quickly went to his head. Wyvern was adamant that he was the true supervillain in the WWE, and vowed to rule Friday nights with an iron fist and stomp out any competition that dared stand in his way. In the women's division, Snow Stevens was selected as the champion, who's a shy and sweet girl from Alabama. By the age of 12, she was already 6 foot 4 and knew exactly what she wanted to be when she was older. With her height and determination, she was certainly going to be a force to be reckoned with. After the draft, we were able to look at the free agents pool and select some more superstars for our roster. In there, we found a whole host of wrestlers who were going to make booking shows a lot easier with their variety of class types. Then, with a completed initial roster, it was time. In our hands lay a power card that was about to decide everything. Which six lucky superstars were about to get the push of a lifetime at SmackDown? The entire roster held their breath as the names started rolling in. Penguin, Bulldozer, P.T. Hattrick, Nathan Diaz, Diane, Archangel. These were the chosen ones who were gifted an unbelievable seven popularity in week one. How on earth were we going to manage the ego of such popular wrestlers? Week 1's show saw real-life superhero Henry Hero take on the current men's champion Wyvern as he promised to rid SmackDown of his evil ways and win the title. He backed up his words in the ring and took down the supervillain in an exhilarating one-star match, but luckily for Wyvern, it wasn't for his belt. Next up, a match that includes two members of the roster that were getting a push, Penguin and Bulldozer. 
Alongside Penguin stood Kyla Moffat, who agreed to team up with him to capture the titles, as Penguin looked more determined than anyone else to do so. Sam Emith, former big game hunter in Australia, quickly took the vacant spot on Bulldozer's team, saying that Penguin's a breakfast for some of the animals that he's conquered in his time. Much to both Bulldozer and Salmon's surprise though, Penguin waddled off with the win and the belts in a one and a half star match. The main event saw P.T. Hattrick, son of the infamous Jerry Hattrick, get a push alongside Nathan Diaz for the Intercontinental title. As they were getting ready to start their match though, the lights dimmed down and out walked Alex Demon. Without saying a word, the match became a triple threat, and of course, the man with wrestling in his blood won the Intercontinental title at the age of just 18. A truly remarkable feat, but boy did he know it. Predictably, that show had us sitting firmly at the bottom of the leaderboard, and things were off to a bad start. Popularity was ridiculously low, and we didn't really have much time to boost it up a lot. With our strategy in place though, we persevered and went again in week two. Seeing as we had a wealth of riches after spending next to nothing on the draft, every week would be a new opportunity to stock up on power cards, and this was important. Any cards that were going to affect opposing brands or the star rating of certain match types were huge, and we needed to buy them all if we were going to put on any remotely decent shows in the first few weeks. Sticking to our strategy of having big stipulations for the opener and main event, Week 2's show had the honorary member of the Viking Raiders trying to prove that Heritage is far superior to Versace Sunglasses, as he took on Yun Ji Ho in a last man standing match. With the power card boost applied, this got a very respectable 3 star rating and started a feud between the two polar opposite stars. Z-list celebrity turned wrestler Barry Scott calls out the Man Mountain himself, Phoenix, who was previously a world champion in karate. Scott picks up the mic and simply says, Bang! And that Phoenix is gone! The influx of Week 2's new free agents allowed us to put on a women's tag match in the mid-card, with Darkness and Diane, or D&D for short, taking on Jessica Diamond and Mackenzie Kill. After claiming that D&D were the most feared women on the planet, Kill and Diamond made them eat their words by taking home the titles. In the main event, we had our first ever Hell in a Cell match, knowing that we needed a big stipulation for the drama curve. Upon arriving at SmackDown, both Elrod and Rockstar Rebel immediately confronted each other, knowing that they were the only two aliens on the roster, with the aim of proving that their home planet was better than the others. Big game hunter Sam and Emith fancied a match against these two, and Wilbur Ortega, of all people, just threw himself in as well, claiming that he just wants to fight, and astonishingly, out of the crowd of giants walks Wilbur, battered and bruised, but proud nonetheless. Our fans increased a little on this show, but we were still miles behind. It was always going to be a slow start, but this looked impossible. After just two weeks, we were nearly 40,000 fans behind WCW in first place, and that was just the beginning. Things would only continue to get worse from here. The strategy seemed to be working to a degree, with our shows slowly improving and the boosted match types allowing us to hit the drama curve, but we needed to ramp it up. Our first PLE was now two weeks away, and that was our first chance of pulling some fans back against the opposition. But were we going to be able to put on a great show, or is our roster just simply too low on popularity? We started to panic a little at having to restart the run again, but booked the show anyway. Week 3's show kicked things off with D&D getting a rematch for the women's tag titles, and making sure to punish Mackenzie and Diamond for trying to take the belts off them. The meanest tag team at SmackDown were back, and more determined than ever to assert their dominance. This one looked like it was ready to explode at Extreme Rules. P.T. Hattrick then interrupts Bjorn and Yunji Ho's match to gloat about his new title, and tell them both that they're nothing compared to him. Bjorn may think he comes from a long line of Nordic ancestors, but that means nothing when he's in the ring with a part of the Hattrick dynasty. Sure enough, Hattrick backs up his words once again and takes home the win against the two feuding stars. Then we had a backstage brawl to close out the show, and it definitely wasn't because we needed the extra fans. No, these two extraterrestrial beings needed to settle things, and a slugfest outside the ring seemed like a fitting way to do it. Rockstar Rebel gets one over on Elrod, and Luke and I watched on in despair as it gets a measly one and a half star rating. Week 4 started with a bit of cunning tactics. We played a veto random superstar on Stephanie McMahon at WCW as they were topping the leaderboards and needed to be slowed down a bit. We also brought the sellout again for this week's show, with Phoenix and Barry Scott finally getting their hands on each other until, yep, you know who, Alex Demon shows up with a key to unlock the cell and declare it as a triple threat match with himself included. Confused as to what he was doing there, both Phoenix and Barry seemed unnerved, but eventually started laying into one another, only for Alex Demon to swoop in for the pin after they were both exhausted. Does Alex Demon even work for WWE? No one seems to have a contract for him or anything. 
Wyvern then pins the fan favourite Henry Hero to the mat again for a second victory in a row, and once again delivers a monologue about how he rules SmackDown and no superhero will stop him. The fans are desperate for Henry to shut this man up next week, and their rivalry increases as a result. Penguin and Kyla Moffat have been fighting champions since claiming the men's tag team belts, and tonight was no different, putting them on the line yet again against the new tag team of Bulldozer and Goldman. Bulldozer claims that Goldman is an elite level athlete that he's recruited from his fitness academy, and that Penguin and Moffat stand no chance against them. Well, in what turned out to be a great advertisement for Bulldozer Fitness, Goldman and the man himself secure the belts going into week 5. Without any of the fans even realising, both Shotgun Sally, a former police officer who was released from the force for far too many false arrests, and Elrod, the sister of Elrod, start brawling backstage. Fans speculate why SmackDown seem to have bust-ups outside the ring so often, but can't help to watch in the thousands as they play out. Shotgun Sally takes the win and bags us a vital extra 10,000 fans. Amidst all the chaos though, something terrible happened. Sally and Ellerod managed to somehow get a 1 star rating for their match that cost us $90,000, throwing the drama curve off at the last second. With WCW and other brands showing no signs of slowing down in terms of fans gained, Week 5's PLE was more important than ever, and had to make a big impact on the standings, otherwise we had an almost impossible mountain to climb. It was time to go to war. Stephanie had been gaining fans on us week after week and needed bringing down a peg, so we played three power cards on her all at once, in the hope that WCW's ratings would suffer as a result. In terms of our show, we went big, playing match type boosting cards here, there and everywhere, whilst putting our stars in huge stipulations. It was either go big or go home, and we were doing everything we could. The show started with a story that would have sold billions of copies if it were written by Marvel. Henry Hero, the fan's beacon of hope, battling it out against Wyvern in an Iron Man match. And no, there was no pun intended. A lot was riding on this match, and not just the fate of this challenge, the fate of SmackDown as well. You'll be relieved to know that this match got a 4.5 star rating, and Henry Hero won. The fans breathed a huge sigh of relief as Friday nights seemed to be taking a turn for the better. The first mid-card match had two of the fiercest ongoing rivalries going at it, with Phoenix and Barry Scott continuing their beef with each other while Bjorn got his hands on Yunji Ho yet again. Through all the chaos though, it was Phoenix that rose from the ashes to claim victory, making a huge statement to the fans in attendance. Could he go on to win gold at SmackDown? There was hardly time to ponder though, as the cell that was suspended above the ring was lowered and out walked D and D. The most feared tag team in WWE history had arrived and were ready to take extreme rules by storm. Their opponents, Mackenzie Kill and Jessica Diamond, looked nervous as they walked down the ramp, and why wouldn't you be? These two are certified nutjobs. What ensued was a bloodbath, with some of the most brutal spots ever seen in a WWE ring. Even Mick Foley was wincing in attendance. Mackenzie and Diamond tried their best to keep up, hitting D&D with everything they had, but these women were different. Eventually, after 30 long minutes, Darkness sent Mackenzie crashing through the top of the cell and covered her to retain the women's tag team titles. I think it's fair to say that four stars were made inside that cell, and D&D's reign was only just beginning. The atmosphere quickly dampened though, as out walked P.T. Hattrick, the most insufferable man on the roster, but at least tonight he didn't have a microphone in his hands. He has a match with Frankie the Freak inside a steel cage coming up, and his intercontinental title is on the line, which you really can't say he hasn't deserved, as he's taken out everyone who's challenged for it up to this point. Oh, Alex Demon's on his way to the ring. Guess this is a triple threat then? Is no one going to ask if he's got permission to be in the ring, let alone the match? No? Okay, I guess. Frankie and Petey don't let this distraction get to them though, as they quickly target one another, but they have to keep an eye on the mysterious man to stop him from stealing the belt. As to be expected at this point, P.T. Hattrick once again does it, and in a classic Hattrick fashion. Frankie plants Demon with a mandible claw chokeslam, and P.T. sweeps in to cover him for the victory. Finally, we had a match to end any debates. Rockstar Rebel vs. Elrod. Planet Loppenheim vs. Schmeldon. Who was going to walk out with the bragging rights? Well, Schmeldon residents, look away, as Rockstar Rebel picks up the win for Loppenheim, ending the feud and any future debates. These two aliens have fought more backstage than in the ring, and the fans really appreciate the sacrifice. With a couple of power cards played to boost match types, we walked out of Extreme Rules with our first ever amazing booking rating, and boy did that feel good. But was it going to make a difference to the challenge? We gained just 106,000 fans. Not great.
NXT and NXT 2.0 both gained tens of thousands more fans than us, but luckily WCW performed badly as well after our power card usage. After just 5 weeks, we were over 100,000 fans off of first place. This might be insurmountable already, and it's not like we even have hugely popular stars now, we still had so much to do. Something had to change, and fast. And change it would, but not in the way you might think. Week 6 started off with more bad news, as Archangel wanted out of the company. Even at this stage, $100,000 is nothing to us, so we happily pay it, but it wouldn't always be as simple as that. The show was another big one with the resources that we had. PT Hattrick interrupted Bjorn and Yunji Ho again to put his title on the line, and won, yet again. There really is no stopping this kid. Yun and Bjorn, both furious that a child got the better of them, blame each other and their rivalry reaches boiling point. Penguin managed to find a new tag partner in the upbeat cowboy Joey Jarrett, and they made a statement by beating the tag champs in a regular match. Were they going to win when it mattered though and claim tag team gold? Big Game Hunter Sam Emoth demands a match with Henry Hero after not being involved for a few weeks after his initial title match. He says Henry is half the size of the smallest grizzly bear he wrestled to submission in his homeland of Australia, so this would be a piece of cake for him. Unfortunately for Salmon though, he wasn't fighting a bear, he was fighting a superhero as Henry picked up the win. In the main event, we finally got to see the women's champion Snow Stevens defend her belt against Trisha, Ella Rod and Shotgun Sally. After anticipating her debut for weeks now, the fans were disappointed when the shy girl from Alabama failed to retain as Sally scaled the cage and escaped for the title. Sally says that this power definitely will not go to her head and that she's learned her lesson after the police force incident. But has she? That didn't seem very genuine. Much like Archangel last week, Amy Nichols appeared to demand 100k to stay. Now, whilst we did have the money, she didn't have any popularity, and at this stage we needed to focus on building select people up. Paying $100,000 made no sense, so sadly, we had to let her go. Bjorn and Yunji Ho seem incapable of having single matches as this week, guess who, Alex Demon shows up to make their tables match a triple threat. Yun picks up the win, but it only got a 1.5 star rating. That's extremely worrying. Henry Hero, with a whopping 43 popularity, takes down Salmon again to a huge pop from the audience, who, perhaps rightly so, are starting to believe that Salmon Emoth is all talk. Sally then retains her women's title at the first time of asking against the same women she faced last week. After the match, she claims that there should be a law that every superstar has to kiss her boots before entering the ring. Yeah, that power really hasn't gone to your head, has it, Sally? The old and supremely wise janitor Gerald Gertz tags up with Chase in the main event against Seymour Clearly and Bulldozer. At this point, Bulldozer has tagged with half of the division, so he can win with anyone by his side. That gets a much needed 3 stars due to a Tornado tag power card boost, and we progress into the results. This seems hopeless. Less fans than last week, and others just gain more and more on us. We were deep into the run at this point and needed to know if it was possible. We were putting our all into it every single week, so if this wasn't enough, then nothing would be. Week 8 stuck to the strategy again, putting on what we deemed to be a good show with Ibiza DJ Platinum taking the win in a Force Count Anywhere opener, and Penguin picking up the tag belts with Joey Jarrett in the main event, and amazingly, they both got 4 star ratings. That means for the first time in a regular week, we got an amazing booking rating, and remarkably, we weren't the worst performing brand. Sure, it was still close, but even getting to the point where we matched the other brands felt like a huge win in itself. We were still excruciatingly far behind, but this was progress at least. Making her debut for SmackDown in Week 9 was Kylie Thickman, the distant relative of a WWE great. And she was up to no good, interfering in Alexia Terra's match with Archangel inside Hell in a Cell. Somehow, even with it being a 2 on 1, Terra manages to win anyway and makes a huge statement in the women's division that people should be scared of her. Barry Scott and Phoenix pick up where they left off with their feud, again trying to outtalk each other on the way to the ring before Phoenix planted Barry through a table. We've got a level 4 rivalry on our hands in that one, just in time for the PLE. Another level 4 rivalry that's been slowly cooking in the background is between Wyvern and Nathan Diaz. They got at each other's necks just weeks ago and are seemingly ready to decide it at Hell in a Cell. Newcomer Baron Urena also impressed the audience with his debut performance, just narrowly being beaten to the win by a sadistic Wyvern, who is adamant that he'll be running SmackDown again soon. After the night was over, we turned on our TVs to check out the other brand's shows, and to our shock, the captain was in a level 4 rivalry with Bianca Belair. Without even offering to sign for SmackDown, she was off making a name for herself elsewhere. I don't know whether to be proud of her or insulted. Either way, best of luck I guess.
After an incredible result last week, we were absolutely devastated to see our numbers drop so drastically. From 46,000 fans to just 25,000. That's what we were getting in the first few weeks. With our opponents showing no sign of slowing down either, we had to act, and act fast. Hell in a Cell needed to be big, and we needed to alter our strategy once it was done. But we weren't giving up hope just yet. This felt like a huge PLE. If we were going to get back into it at all, these were the shows that would do it. Immediately we were met with issues though. Both Sonya and Stephanie attacked us with power cards, doubling the cost of all stipulations and power cards in the store, which we were relying heavily on at this point. Even though we had a fair bit of cash still, this wasn't good. We needed to cling on to any money we had so we could continue to put on crazy shows in the hope of winning over fans. This didn't stop us from putting on a banger though. We opened with a branded PLE bonus Hell in a Cell match between two bitter rivals and PT Hattrick, who was putting his Intercontinental title on the line again. Frankie the Freak decided to sprint in and try to do anything he could to lose PT the match, but his efforts were futile as PT lifted the gold above his head for the 10th week in a row. What a run from this young man, but his attention had fully turned to the Freak now as that interference was personal. We played a coast to coast card to add plus two to our show quality as Tyler Breeze interfered with Shotgun Sally and Elrod's match resulting in a Sally win. Then it was time to settle a rivalry that had been brewing for weeks. Goldman and Bulldozer wanted their titles back off of Penguin and Joey Jarrett, and they were willing to work for it. This tables match was an absolute classic, with the fans genuinely having no idea who was going to come out on top. After a lot of back and forth, Bulldozer orders his student to finish things, and Goldman plants Penguin through a table to secure the win for Bulldozer Fitness Academy. The belts were back around their waists, and they were letting everyone know about it. D&D returned to the ring in a TLC match as the final midcard, against a surprising new tag team partnership that no one saw coming. The Wicked Witch of the West had cut a promo turning face, and with that, claimed that she wanted to be the one to bring down D&D, with the help of former tag champ Mackenzie Kill by her side. Unfortunately though, at Hell in a Cell, it wasn't meant to be, with Diane and Darkness retaining the belts and issuing a warning to the new partners to not mess with them. Then the main event, Barry Scott, Phoenix. Two of the biggest stars in the company are going one-on-one -on -one backstage to resolve their beef. Let's hope this one's still it bangs, and sure enough, Barry Scott ends up winning in a four and a half star match. That show was pretty good, but was it enough to get us back in it? Our 124,000 fans seemed like a small amount, but it was actually enough to beat NXT and WCW. Wow, this could actually be the start of some sort of comeback. We could at- oh wait, no, never mind. NXT 2.0 gained 30,000 fans on us. With them now firmly in the lead, and almost 200,000 fans in front of us, things were all but over. Our main stars were only just getting to low 50s popularity, and we still had so many that were helplessly low. At this point, we knew that a change in approach was required if we were going to make any sort of comeback. So, Luke and I got to thinking. I think with a Fatal 4-Way, we're getting so many more people, more popularity, and faster. We're not having to rest as many people. Should we not be looking to put fatal four ways on or triple threats or ideally fatal four ways in tag teams in every single card for every single week so we take the strategy we have been doing we just put four people in every single match i don't know how that will work in terms of uh show variety but i think we should at least test it and if it works then we just start going crazy on 16 person shows put some interferences in there as well and then get the promos there's like 20 people appearing every single week Despite being 200,000 fans down, our new strategy seemed solid. Having as much popularity on as many superstars as possible would mean that we could put on good shows every single week even if our main stars needed a rest. So we got to planning week 11 show. To help out with the new strategy, we used our quick recovery power card so the roster was replenished and ready to go. Things got off to an incredible start as Sam and Emeth escaped a steel cage containing Henry Hero, Seymour Clearly and Chase to win the opening match. That landed a 4.5 star rating, and Salmon cupped his ears to the fans as he walked up the ramp, knowing that they all thought he couldn't back up his words. P.T. Hattrick then grabs a microphone and heads to the ring. Oh boy. He goes on about how he's beaten everyone. Even though he's calling them out, he's still put them in their place, and for 10 weeks, only 4 less weeks than years he's been alive, he's defended his title. But P.T. immediately goes quiet and red in the face. He sprints out the ring and the crowd murmurs to themselves, wondering if P.T. Hattrick was only 15 years old. Surely not. 
After an extended spell with the titles, Wicked Witch and Mackenzie Kill finally dethrone the champions, as D&D can't believe they've lost them on a regular weekly show. They vow for revenge, as the rivalry hits level 4 already. Nathan Diaz was about to face Wyvern in a 1v1, when, out of nowhere, Alex Demon shows up to get involved once again. But this time, Alex Demon wasn't going to make it a triple threat, as a debuting Mr. Gold walked out to back up Diaz. Fans were confused at this one, but happy to see Wyvern and the mysterious Demon put in their place. Speaking of debuts and random matches, the main event had it all. OM and Gary Ghost, two stars that had recently come up from developmental, were thrown straight into a Falls Count Anywhere match, with Gary Ghost claiming the victory. He says to the crowd that he has supernatural beings guarding him from beyond the grave, so he has no doubt in his mind that he's going right to the top. OM looked terrified and quickly scurried out the stadium. Overall, this wasn't a bad week for us, even if we did gain the least amount of fans. The new strategy was off to a good start, but was it too late? Over 200,000 fans seemed like a ridiculous amount, and our hope was starting to dwindle. Whatever hope we did have left took another big hit going into week 12 though, as we started off the show with a terrible 1.5 star match. Wicked Witch continued to impress the fans by taking down both Diane and Archangel, but things seemed a little off with Diane. After losing their tag belts last week, D&D were clearly going through some problems, and Diane's head was not in the right place. Then, to her horror, the darkness walked out with a new tag team partner in Shotgun Sally. And they actually won their match against Ellerod and Mackenzie Kill. Darkness seemed to be sending a message to Diane that she needed to up her game if she wanted to remain part of D&D. Penguin then shocked the crowd once more, as he announced that he can in fact talk. And it turns out, he's not really a nice person. He turned heel by claiming that penguins are a better race than humans. Phoenix interrupts him and challenges him to a match, thinking he needed to be taught a lesson. Annoyingly, after a glitch in the game prevented Bjorn and Yunji Ho from completing their rivalry at Hell in a Cell, things needed resolving. So they decided to slog it out in a submission match to finally decide whether Versace shades or traditional Nordic dress was better. And being the warrior he is, Bjorn comes out on top and sings the national anthem of Denmark to the confused audience. The main event saw the fighting champion P.T. Hattrick defending his title against three other men, but P.T. looked different, nervous almost. After his blunder last week, he seems to have lost his arrogance, and this absolutely shows as he gets distracted feuding with Frankie the Freak and ends up losing his belt to Chase. He blames Frankie and their rivalry is now nuclear. Chase on the other hand cannot believe it and dedicates his title win to his idol Jin. Week 13 was much of the same. We had a strategy and we were sticking to it. If we were going to get anything out of this run, we'd at least have to be consistent. An Extreme Rules Fatal 4-Way opened the show with Bjorn and Gary Ghost being thrown in with Barry Scott and the Freak. Such a star-studded matchup only gained us a 2-star rating, but midway through the match, Gary Ghost started to claim that he was the reincarnation of one of Bjorn's ancestors, who'd come back to take revenge on him for not fulfilling his family's legacy. This clearly got in Bjorn's head as him and Ghost fought their way backstage and disappeared, leaving Barry Scott to hit the Sillit Bang and the Freak was gone. The first mid-card match had Darkness watching on as Diane tried to prove herself against Christina, Mackenzie Kill and Erin Conan. Sadly, she was the one that was planted through a table by Christina as she picked up the victory and gloated right in Mackenzie Kill's face. That's surely not going to go down well. Bulldozer saw potential in Sam and Emeth and offered for him to join the Bulldozer Fitness Academy, but Sam was more interested in getting his hands on Henry Hero. DJ Platinum rocked up as Hero's partner and managed to take the win against the dysfunctional tag team. Finally, we had another backstage brawl, which begs the question, does SmackDown even hire security? I know one man that could help out. Shotgun Sally continues her reign as the women's champion by dispatching Ella Rod into a nearby garbage can. That feud is really heating up. Sam and Emeth and Bulldozer weren't happy about losing their match last week, so demanded to fight Platinum and Henry Hero again in week 14. But unfortunately for the fitness fanatic and the big game hunter, the result was the same. Fan favourite Henry Hero won again and Platinum makes another statement as to why he should be getting a push at SmackDown. Barry Scott then finds Petey Hattrick seemingly doing homework backstage, that's weird, and invites him into the ring to get over losing his title. Hattrick and Scott put on a show against the Freak and Barry's former rival Phoenix, coming out with the win and giving Petey some of his mojo back. In the main event, the budding feud between Nathan Diaz and Wyvern continued alongside bitter rivals Seymour and Chase. Before the match, Seymour told Chase that he was coming for his newly acquired title, and backs up the talk with a win in a Falls Count Anywhere match. Wyvern seems to be getting extremely angry at the fact that he's not being respected as a legitimate threat anymore, and takes it out on Nathan Diaz after the bell, increasing their rivalry to level 4. 
NXT 2.0 continued to run away with things in terms of fans, but we managed to secure a to the moon power card from that show, which could be absolutely massive. That's an extra 50 in popularity to almost any star of our choosing, but who would be getting the push? Well, it's Backlash next week, so whoever puts in a worthy performance will be rewarded with a big boost in popularity. This was a massive week for us both in terms of storyline and the challenge, but would it be everything that it needed to be? We could have never predicted what was about to come as a result of this show. Kurt Angle kicks off the week by vetoing Barry Scott, one of our most popular wrestlers. Fortunately for us, he wasn't in any major rivalry, so he could use this time to rest up ready for a massive final 10 weeks of the run. We had to make this show count, so we played a special promotion card along with multiple match type boosting cards as well. Kurt had started a war with us and we weren't going to forget it, no matter how far in front of us he was. Backstage brawl number 3792 was our opener and the white hot feud between Shotgun Sally and Ellerod was set to be completed. The women's title had been hot potatoing around a lot and the question still remained, who was going to end the run as champ? Well, Ellerod takes a big leap towards that goal by locking Shotgun Sally in a police car of all places, making sure she couldn't continue and therefore winning the title. Petey Hattrick, looking a bit more like his old self again, came out to fight the Freak in a tables match, and this one had been building for a while. Petey puts on a masterclass in technical wrestling, outwitting Frankie over and over again, before he finally puts him through a table with a dropped toehold. He grabs a microphone and starts jeering at Frankie for losing to such a basic move, then reveals that he hasn't been completely honest. That high school jacket he wears to the ring is actually from his high school. After class, he comes straight to the arena to fight and doesn't even have time to change. He then goes on to say his father, Jerry Hattrick, pulled some strings for him, allowing a 15-year-old to compete in WWE. The crowd gasp as this is unheard of and probably illegal, but they can't deny his talent. On the way out, with that off of his chest, he mocks the freak again, shouting, you lost to a kid, a kid that's got band practice tomorrow before biology. In the middle of the card, we had a match that's been largely all talk, with the big game hunter Sam and Emeth vowing to take the title off of Henry Hero. He walks down the ramp in his iconic orange googly-eyed hat, used to lure predators in before he takes them out, and smirks the entire time as if he's already won the match. Henry Hero enters and reassures the crowd that he'll be finishing this challenge as champion. Ever since he beat Wyvern, SmackDown has become a much better place, and he wasn't going to let that go. These two were about to go to war. Salmon takes an early advantage, locking in all the holds that typically take down the animals he hunts. Bear holds, choke holds, you name it, Henry was enduring them. But Henry is a hero for a reason, and fought back no matter what. It really seemed like he had an answer for everything. Weapons were brought out, and it was carnage with both men withstanding some brutal treatment. While on the outside, Salmon hoists Henry up and power bombs him directly onto the ringside barricade, before throwing his lifeless body back into the ring. The whole stadium went silent as they knew what was coming. It was time for a Salmon Splash. We've seen numerous crocodiles get taken out by this one, and Henry was simply his next big hunt. Salmon Emeth covers him and takes home the gold, becoming the men's world champion with just 10 weeks left of the run. Could he be the man to end the run as the face of SmackDown's men's division? After that shocking upset, Wyvern walks out to a rather mute reception, which infuriates him. In order to make people scared of him again, he was going to need to make an example of Nathan Diaz, and that he did, locking him into the Y-axis and not letting up even after he tapped. That rivalry is over, and Wyvern seemed to put some of the fear back into the audience. The Wicked Witch had been picking up a lot of momentum in the build-up to Backlash, going into things as the women's tag champ alongside Mackenzie Kill, and she was looking to put on another spectacle here. Darkness had offered Diane one last chance to prove herself. She'd messed up too many times to count now, and she was sick of it. Either they win the belts here, or Diane is out of D&D. The Wicked Witch decided that she wanted to get her revenge on them properly, and ducked out the way as Diane ended up hitting Darkness with her running clothesline finisher. Distracted and shocked at what she'd just done, the Wicked Witch took advantage after a flying leg drop from Mackenzie, retaining the titles and putting a definitive end to D&D as we know it. In what was comfortably our best show to date, we gained an impressive 155,000 fans, which had us comfortably beating both NXT and WCW. And due to our backstage brawl we included gaining us a further 10,000 fans, we actually ended up with the most out of any of the brands. A small win, but a win nonetheless. Was it even possible to win the challenge? Maybe, but not likely. Money had become pretty tight as well after putting on such big stipulations for weeks on end, so was that going to become a factor as well? Regardless though, we couldn't have predicted what would happen next. Triple H came to inform us that our new SmackDown champion, Sam Anemoth, had been asked to film a movie. 
Apparently, as soon as he walked out the arena with the belt, his agent got on the phone with multiple Hollywood directors trying to get him a role and managed to land him an offer. This would mean that Salmon was out for three long weeks, but would give us $530 up front and boost his popularity as a result. At this point, it was a no-brainer. We needed the cash and had plenty of other stars we'd built up to step in while he was gone. So off he went to film and we got back to booking our shows with our new influx of cash. One thing that we had to make sure we were doing was completing the Hall of Fame trophy challenges as well, as not only would this be vital in the end result, but they also give you power cards, sometimes random ones. If we could get a network special card from one of these, we could use it in week 20 or 25, and that could turn the run on its head, as they're ridiculously overpowered. A TLC opener saw Phoenix finally get his hands on Penguin, who'd been tormenting him behind the scenes for weeks now. But sadly for him, it was the other rivalry that would shine through. Bjorn sends a message to the spirits of his ancestors by forcing Gary Ghost to tap out with an armbar. Diane then steps into the ring with a microphone and says that she is disappointed in the darkness. She considered her a friend, but clearly she was only ever in it for herself. Then she goes on to say that it was actually her that was letting the team down all along, and that she deserves a shot at the women's title to prove that she's the best in the business. Elrod reluctantly accepts the offer, but doesn't seem to think much of Diane as a threat. The woman in question, Darkness, was in the main event against the Wicked Witch and Archangel, but she fails to take the opportunity to prove Diane wrong as Wicked Witch walks out with the win yet again. And at this point, she is ridiculously over with the crowd. Frankie the Freak storms into our office in week 17, demanding $100,000 to stay. He said he's fed up of losing and will sue the company for employing a 15-year-old if he doesn't get what he wants. Seeing as he's one of our most popular stars, we agree to this to try and help with his morale after Backlash, but that's another big blow to our budget. Joey Jarrett then rightly claims that he's been forgotten about a bit after losing the tag team titles, and searches the locker room for a partner to challenge for them again. DJ Platt accepts his offer, and the two cruisers cruise to a loss against Bulldozer Fitness Academy, who are proving to be formidable champions. Bjorn demands to fight against Gary Ghost again, saying that he wasn't getting away with things that easily, and Gary meets him in the ring, but summons Henry Hero and P.T. Hattrick to make it harder for Bjorn to attack him. Unfortunately for Gary, Penguin rushes into the ring and attacks Henry Hero, meaning that Bjorn could grab his arm once again and force him to tap. Barry Scott comes back from his forced vacation and immediately wants to fight again, putting his name into the hat for a fatal four-way in the middle of the card. Seeing as Barry was the man to give P.T. his mojo back, Frankie goes straight after him, but Barry is prepared and sprays some Silip Bang he got from under the ring right in his uncovered eye, resulting in a dirty, but by all means legal victory for Scott. Darkness claims that she should never have lost her match last week, and to prove that she's a top-tier talent, she adds another opponent in with Erin Conan, making it a fatal four-way. Darkness backs up her talk by pinning Conan after an interference from Christina, who had been threatening Eren for a couple of weeks now. We were consistently matching the other brands in terms of fans gained at this point, but it wasn't enough. We needed to be beating them by large amounts week on week. After weeks of winning matches and putting on brilliant charity promos, Barry Scott asks us for a title match. The only problem is that our champion is away for another week, but thankfully we can promise a shot in the next three weeks, which we do and everyone's happy. Wanting to escape Bjorn's rage for a week, Gary Ghost teams up with DJ Platt for a cage match against the champions. No titles on the line. Due to there being no incentive for them, Bulldozer and Goldman seem to take the challenge lightly and actually end up losing as a result. While they were distracted, Platinum called for the cage door to be opened and escaped. Thankfully for them though, they still have their belts. Worried that Diane is going to show her up, Darkness interferes with her fatal four-way match and attacks Wicked Witch, who she's been cooking up quite the feud with in recent shows. Unfortunately for Darkness, she accidentally sends Wicked Witch flying into Elrod, who Diane quickly hits with her finisher and pins. It seems like D&D are still working together in some weird kind of way, but Darkness isn't happy about it at all. In the main event, the Intercontinental title is on the line in an Extreme Rules Fatal 4-Way. Chase, who's been getting harassed by Seymour on a weekly basis, manages to retain his title and holds it high in the air above the three men that he just beat for it. Seymour looks enraged and seems to be planning something as he watches Chase walk down the ramp. Incredibly, without realising, we fulfilled Barry Scott's request to have a title match in Week 18. At the time, we didn't realise, but he was wanting a shot at the Intercontinental title all along, so at least he's happy, as currently he's one of our most popular stars. Elrod had a big match on her hands in Week 19, as she asked to defend her title against her rival Diane, and two other women in Shotgun Sally and Mackenzie Kill, who had been having their own arguments as of late. Elrod makes a big statement to the division and holds onto her belt, promising everyone that she will be ending this run as the world champion. 
Phoenix, who seemingly has fallen off the map in this run, is granted a squash match against Jacob Tank, who is having his first fight at SmackDown. Penguin tries to intrude to ruin the match for Phoenix, but he's simply too strong for them both, winning the match anyway and telling Penguin that if he wants a piece of him, he'll get it soon enough. Upon arriving back from his movie, Sam and Emith is raring to go again, and schedules a table match for him, Seymour and Chase. Petey Hattrick quickly interrupts and claims that he already knows that Salmon's film is going to be terrible, as he can hardly cut a promo here. After telling him that his fourth grade nativity play was a better theatrical performance than his recent film, Salmon grabs Petey and launches him halfway across the ring through a table, making a point to the young man that he was not ready to face him yet. The show ends up being a big performer for us and gains us a further 13,000 fans on the leaders due to the backstage brawl we included. The gap between us and the top was monumental, but not quite unachievable, and a lot was riding on SummerSlam to put us on the right track to winning. Due to earning our second Hall of Fame trophy after week 19, we were actually first on the leaderboard, but if you know us, you'll know that's not good enough. We need to win on all metrics, and fans were the only thing on our mind. With it being SummerSlam, it meant that we could unlock the final arena available in the run, which set us back a huge amount of money. Luckily, we had a couple of free arena booking cards we could use to get some of the money back, but we were still running pretty low. Also, up until this point, stamina had been managed extremely well, but we were starting to run a little low on a couple of our stars, most notably Chase and Seymour, who were set to be the main event of this evening in a Falls Count Anywhere match. Our thinking was that we could get the title off of them in a following week and use it to elevate a future feud, so for now, as long as they didn't get injured, we just needed them to get through this. A rivalry that has slightly gone under the radar started things off. Erin Conan and Christina both joined the WWE from UFC for the purpose of this challenge, and decided to bring their beef over from there. After a few weeks of callouts and some rough matches, they were at level 4 in this submission match, and it was Christina who got the last laugh in an incredible 4.5 star match. Diane had to watch in the wings as her former tag team partner fought for the titles versus the champions alongside Archangel, and it appears that the darkness may have been right all along, as she picks up the gold once again, leaving the fans begging for a singles push for the Wicked Witch. The next match was a big one. Both Phoenix and Penguin and Bjorn and Gary Ghost had serious problems with each other, and now they were all locked inside a steel cage. This was a recipe for chaos. In the weeks leading up to the show, Gary Ghost had been picking up nothing but losses against Bjorn and looked like he was hungry to put that right. After a gruelling cage match with multiple close escapes for all competitors, Gary Ghost took his chance while Bjorn was trying to stop Phoenix, and crashed into Penguin with a dropkick against the cell wall, resulting in a pinfall win for the haunting spirit. Bjorn was absolutely livid that he'd lost sight of his true enemy and allowed him to pick up the win, and vowed to get his revenge at WrestleMania, but Gary Ghost couldn't care less. As far as he was concerned, his job was done. Barry Scott, remembering the success he had in identifying talent in PT Hattrick, scoured the dressing room for another teammate he could find success with, and found an extremely bitter Jacob Tank, who just wanted a chance to show everyone what he could do. And Barry Scott gave him just that, picking up yet another win against Bill Kirk and the Freak. The main event was already a banger before it even started. Seymour clearly, the man who got fired from his job as an optician due to a misplaced scalpel, and Chase, who built his entire life on the idea of being a character from Tekken, were about to go to hell and back. Kendo stick shot after kendo stick shot, Chase was really testing Seymour's limits. He knew that Seymour was low on stamina coming into this, and it looked like he was taking advantage of that. In what might be one of the most grotesque finishes to a match I've ever seen, Chase picks him up and slams him down headfirst onto the steel steps. It may not have hurt Seymour, who seems to have an incredibly high pain threshold, but it definitely knocked him clean out and allowed Chase to pick up the victory, retaining his belt yet again. The entire audience stood up and applauded the determination of these two fighters as they hobbled out of the arena. As the results rolled in, it was NXT that performed the best, and started to look like our main opponent as NXT 2.0 lost a boatload of fans over the rest. We'd now clawed our way to under 200,000 fans off the leaders, and that was huge. Five weeks to close that gap fully, and potentially pull off the greatest comeback of all time. This wasn't possible. Was it? Surely not. We weren't believing just yet. We were going for it. In week 21, we spent nearly half of our budget on power cards, knowing we had another free arena booking to get us by. If we were going to stand a chance, we'd not only need to put on incredible shows every week, but we'd also need to disrupt the opponents as well. 
Henry Hero and DJ Platt kick things off with a win in an Extreme Rules opener against the Tag Champs. It seems like whenever the belts aren't on the line, these two just don't show up. What a terrible attitude to have. Sam Anemith then puts his world title on the line in a mid-card against his new rival PT Hattrick, Rockstar Rebel and Yunji Ho, and made an example yet again of PT hitting him with a devastating Salmon Splash through a table to retain his title. Then finally, the main event saw Ella Rod defend her title against Diane, Archangel and the new signing to the roster, Whitney Kiss, who won a reality TV competition to become a wrestler and was voted into the main event via a poll on SmackDown's Twitter feed. Diane, who is furious that Elrod keeps retaining the belt without pinning her, demands a singles match with her so she can have a proper chance at securing gold. Bulldozer starts off week 22 with a crazy request. He wants $50,000 for helping the brand out, but his contract is only worth 2,000 tops. Unfortunately, with the run this close to the end, we need every penny we have, so we reject the request. He can't be that angry, can he? There's only three weeks left of the run after this one anyway, so how bad could it be? Diane got her wish in the opening of the card, facing Ella Rod in a 1v1 submission match to clear the rivalry. And what would you know, she actually did it. As soon as she got her 1v1 match, she made it count and became the new women's champion in spite of the darkness, who was noticeably angry when walking out for her match. This actually did help her out though, as she took out all of that anger on the new kid, Whitney Kiss, who ended up going through a table off the top rope as the darkness secured the win. After their win last week, DJ Platt and Henry Hero said that Goldman and Bulldozer were scared to put the titles on the line, as they knew they'd lose them. So, angered by the claims, they did just that this week, and managed to win the match when it mattered. These two might be irritating, but they sure are prize fighters. In the main event, a severely injured Chase was thrown into an Extreme Rules Fatal 4-Way for his Intercontinental title. It was an executive decision made by the authority that was best for business, as his frail body couldn't handle it anymore. Getting pinned in just 5 minutes by Frankie the Freak, who became the new Intercontinental Champion and finally put an end to his run of bad results. This was actually an incredible result for us as well, as now we could use the Intercontinental title to elevate Frankie and Barry's rivalry even further, which would be very helpful going into week 25. 62,000 fans tuned in to watch SmackDown, and that ended up being nearly double of what NXT gained, which was very positive. But still not quite good enough, as ideally we needed to be close to the leaders going into WrestleMania, and currently we were still over 100,000 fans off. After all the positivity from gaining fans on the other brands, Bulldozer quickly puts an end to it, storming into our office and demanding $100,000 just one week after he asked for a loyalty bonus. This was the only time we'd let him down before this, and he immediately went to the extreme, and we had a rough decision to make. We had barely any money, and we'd run out of free arena booking power cards, meaning we couldn't really afford it. However, he was our tag team champion. In the end, we had to let him go and crown new champions in week 23. Had Bulldozer just put the final nail in the coffin of this run? That was a big matchup we needed for WrestleMania, and was going to affect us badly. To try and keep the pressure on though, we applied a Best Friends Forever power card to Sonya, as this would reduce two of our rivalries by one level, massively disrupting her booking for WrestleMania. Our show also went incredibly well, with us building on our existing rivalries and crowning new tag team champions in Bill Kirk and Phoenix, who actually managed to get a 5 star match against Penguin and Jacob Tank, with no existing rivalry. We gained a huge amount of fans for the week, but we couldn't help but think it was too little too late. And with a new tag team rivalry just being started, was it going to be able to pay dividends at WrestleMania? We had a problem in week 24. Our women's champion, Diane, simply didn't have enough stamina to compete for her title, and didn't have a current rival for it anyway. We had to make a big call, but we knew it was the right one. We needed the match type boost for a title match, so had to release Diane, freeing up the title to be contended for in tonight's show. It seemed harsh, but we had to put the challenge before our feelings, and this is just what needed to be done. In the opening match for the newly vacated title, Wicked Witch and her rival Darkness would also have Mackenzie Kill and Shotgun Sally to deal with in a fatal four-way. Sally had identified Kill as a potential threat to the business due to her name, and tried to forcefully arrest her backstage, which caused a flare-up of emotions between the two. As Sally chased Mackenzie around the ring with handcuffs, Wicked Witch hit Darkness with her broomstick and pinned her to become the new women's champion. Is she going to be able to defend it at WrestleMania and finish the run as champion though? She was certainly one of the most popular stars on the roster, that's for sure. 
After securing the vacant tag team titles last week, Bill Kirk and Phoenix managed to lose them in a rematch, and the team of Penguin and Jacob Tank took home the gold, with Jacob screaming to the fans that he deserved this as he walked up the ramp. As Rockstar Rebel and Yunji Ho's rivalry to contest who wears the colour pink better played out, Sam and Emith once again made a statement to PT. He warned him that he didn't belong here and was mince meat to a man his size. PT looked genuinely scared for his life as he picked himself up and left the ring. The main event then had Frankie the Freak defending his title for the first time, and in what ended up being a crazy night in terms of title changes, the third one changed hands as Barry Scott claims the gold, and honestly, he deserves it. He's definitely been an unsung hero of this entire challenge. Congratulations, Barry. And then, it was time. WrestleMania was upon us, and we were a painful 84,000 fans behind first place. It was an incredible effort, and we did our utmost best, but through a mix of bad luck and potentially some decisions that could have been made better, it looked like it wasn't quite good enough. We still had a final show to book though, and we wanted to give these calls the ending they deserved. Oh, f*** off, Stephanie. Hitting us with a veto star card at the very last hurdle, and it was by far our most important star going into the show, Sam and Emith. Now we can't put on a men's world title match, and Petey doesn't get a chance at redemption. Although, with how Salmon has been treating him over the last few weeks, he was probably relieved. Well, if it wasn't over before this, it almost certainly is now. Sadly, we had to release Salmon to vacate his title, and tried to book the best show possible to give it one last shot. Multiple level 4 rivalries, and huge match types. This was going to be a blockbuster of a show at the very least. We'd also saved a load of power cards to use on NXT, only to find out that you had to use them in week 24 for them to take effect at WrestleMania. Everything seemed to be going wrong, but regardless, we knew we had a killer card and progressed to the show. We started with the new women's champion, Wicked Witch, taking on her longtime rival, Darkness, in a Falls Count Anywhere match, and the fans couldn't be more excited. Going into the match, the Wicked Witch had an astounding 99 popularity, which I feel like is an achievement in itself, given what we started with. These two women were leaving everything out there, with most of the action taking place on the outside. After what seemed like multiple career-threatening bumps, the Darkness hit a massive Spanish fly and covered the Wicked Witch for the win, successfully ending the run as our women's champion. This is controversial though, as technically her former teammate turned rival Diane never lost the title, meaning that the Darkness is being accused of being a fraud by her on social media. And to think they were once the best of friends with the same goal to make SmackDown as horrible of a place as they could. What a shame to see it turn out this way. Bill Kirk and Phoenix then got the opportunity to win their titles back again off of Penguin and Tank. This was a tables match, and not a pretty one. Phoenix and Penguin have a long history of beef, and Jacob Tank was simply angry at the world. Penguin and Tank ended up taking the win after handcuffing Phoenix to the ropes and laying into Bill Kirk, who was just an innocent personal trainer who wanted a career change. The vacated world title fell into the hands of two men to fight for it, Bjorn and Gary Ghost. These two have done nothing but antagonise each other for weeks, making sure to make the other's life a living hell, but not for much longer, as they settled it in an Iron Man match. 15 minutes stood between them and the title, but who was going to come out with the win? Well, Gary Ghost hits a monstrous spear to take the first pinfall, but mere seconds later, Bjorn is up and fighting again, and hits him with the winds of change! That makes it one all. This one looks like it's going right down to the wire. A few minutes later, and Gary Ghost's injured right arm that Bjorn had been continuously locking into submission holds started to play up. As he's no regular mortal though, it starts to freak out and try to detach itself from his body. I can only imagine the pain he must be going through right now. Somehow though, through the searing pain, he hits a running dropkick against the ropes and scores a second pinfall. This could be over. Only four minutes left and Bjorn is out of it. But no, he wasn't done just yet. With two minutes left on the clock, he picks up Gary into a vertical suplex and nails him with the Viking driver. That's it, this one's over. A quick pinfall makes it 2-2, but Bjorn is running out of time to win the match. Only seconds remained as Bjorn targeted the damaged arm, striking it over and over again, and covers him to make it 3-2 at the death. Wow, what an incredible match that was, as Bjorn overcomes his haunting spirit and walks away with the world title. Shotgun Sally then takes to the ring for her last chance to arrest Mackenzie Kill, who she's adamant is out to cause havoc at SmackDown, but Mackenzie has pleaded her innocence the entire time. The fans know she's innocent and can't understand why Sally won't just leave her alone, but nevertheless, they need to settle this and settle this now. This was a last woman standing match, and it got brutal very quickly. 
Kendo sticks and chairs were used, and both competitors were damaged. However, there could only be one winner. Mackenzie Kill hits her signature fallaway cutter, and Sally was out. She celebrates prematurely by shushing her critics, and eventually the referee counts to 10 to grant Kill the win. In a feel-good WrestleMania moment, Mackenzie Kill clears her name and manages to overcome the corrupt cop. During this match, Luke and I were discussing alternative strategies for another run, as we actually ended up doing better than we were expecting, so we're thinking we might have to redo it. Yeah, so so maxing out every card and putting as many people in every show as possible is clearly working. Yeah. I just don't know if we're too late. Like, we missed out on 10 weeks of the season trying this, so I don't realistically think we can do it. Even though it'll be close, I think we're going to miss out, like, 20, 30,000 fans behind. So I'm pretty confident in this strategy. So yeah, I think yeah. once the results come, it's going to be really annoying, but I think we just start again and replay the entire thing through with this new strategy. As we got to the main event, I couldn't help but feel weirdly proud. Not only have we created some megastars out of a roster with no popularity, but we've also just put on three five-star matches at WrestleMania, and I knew this one was going to be our fourth. Frankie the Freak, who was definitely a staple in this run, is facing perhaps one of the other most important people, Barry Scott. The Freak manages to knock out Barry Scott, resulting in him becoming the Intercontinental Champion for the second time, as the show was officially over. Another 5-star match to close it out, and you can't say we didn't smash it eventually. It was slow starting, but we ended up with a very respectable roster, so all that was left to do was watch the results roll in and see how close we actually came. But how many fans do we need to win by? Like, uh, well, we 70, were 84,000 80, fans. fans. 84,000 fans before this show. We've got 298, which is extremely that's respectable. Pretty, yeah, that's pretty good. How much is NXT going to get? They're not <laughs> first. Know, but... oh, 232, okay. That's not not that many. Have we... 177 have we from been... NXT. Do we have more? I don't even know if we beat NXT. 181,000. Oh my word. Uh, it's going to be extremely close. <laughs> yes! We've yeah! done it! I don't... Wait, we've actually done it. How? How? Oh my god, 11... That... No, 10... That... 11,100 fans with the How backstage brawl. That? It was the backstage brawl. No, but we're about 200,000 fans down at one point. That's right, in what might be the greatest story ever told through WWE 2K23's My GM Mode, we somehow, some way, managed to pull off the comeback of all comebacks. At one point, we were around 250,000 fans off of first place, and here we are celebrating the win. I genuinely cannot believe it happened. We actually won, by only 11,000 fans too. We didn't get any network special cards, and we had some pretty bad luck in general throughout the run, but none of that matters now. This was by far the hardest challenge that we've ever done and probably ever will do, so if you enjoyed this one, then chances are you'll enjoy our other MyGM content as well, so I've put another video on screen for you now to click through to.